All right. This is Arab Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM San Francisco. I'm Jamal Dejani. My co-host Jess Ghanam is in Qatar. When he returns next week, we will have an update on developing news in the Arabian Gulf region. Today we're going to talk about Christmas in Palestine. We're going to talk about food in Palestine. Of course, we are going to talk about politics in Palestine. Back in the house is journalist and co-host of Blanche's Feast in the Middle East. The one and only Blanche is in the house. And uh, welcome again to Arab Talk, uh, and Merry Christmas to you and to your family. Thank you. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Always a pleasure to see you again. So uh, you've been actually very busy this year. And of yeah. course, all of you know Blanche uh, from this show. She's been on the show several times, and she always brought us goodies, which we will <laughs> share with you. We'll just have you look at it and, and maybe try to imagine Smell a vision. Smell, yeah, smell the <laughs> vision. But you've been very busy, and you've had two trips, mm -hmm. not one, almost one after the other. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you've been to uh, Palestine, You've, uh, and I assume you've been there not only to reconnect uh, with your roots, but also for a culinary experience and, and an education trip. Yes, yes, So uh, let's start by talking about this a little bit. Sure, sure. So the first time um, when I went in the summer, I went with my family. And, you know, I haven't been there in 20 years. And definitely I want to kind of tap into the, like, the culinary world there. But I also wanted to just see how are people living there. And, you know, a lot of things uh, shocked me, like the amount of growth that's happened in cities like Ramallah, for example, which was really a small town. And now it's been built up so much because there isn't really room for expansion outside of the city. Um, but uh, the resilience of the people there, despite their um, ongoing humiliation and um, uh, roadblocks and checkpoints and settlement expansion, it's truly been a humbling experience to witness their incredible resilience. Um, and I noticed that they're in the midst of a cultural revolution uh, that I didn't witness before. Uh, I think what Palestinians are undergoing there is they realize that they really don't have any military power. They don't really have any kind of power. But what they're trying to do is assert their identity through culture. And I'm seeing that on multiple levels, not just in food, but I'm also seeing it in music, in theater, um, even in the most um, oppressed places like Lid, for example, where they've been pushed to the margins. They've opened a little bit. Of, they've opened a little theater there so that they can uh, bring their community together and express themselves through that art, which I thought was phenomenal because it's what they've got left, basically. Right, and I'm sure you've experienced, and this is something most people don't, uh, probably a lot of people, they keep asking, well, are there any Christians in Palestine? Yes. And considering <laughs> now we're talking about, you know, we this is the holiday season, and I'm sure you've been to Bethlehem mm -hmm. and crossed through the uh, upper tide wall that Israel uh, basically yeah. Constructed. What was your experience going uh, through this and seeing it? And you said because you said you haven't been there for 20 years. Yes, I mean the wall is humongous and you know if you look at it from a Christian perspective Jesus would not be pleased with this hideous wall that they've cut up Bethlehem with uh, and you know you see that walled off hotel which Banksy has erected right next to the wall they only get 25 minutes of sunlight a day because of this wall and they've cut off any kind of uh, transportation, communication with the outside world. And if they're wondering why Christians are leaving in mass, it's because of this incredible uh, apartheid wall that's there. And, you know, it's not like Christians can freely worship. Like if, if a Christian is living in Bethlehem and they want to go to the Holy Sepulchre Church in Jerusalem, it's going to be really hard to do so. And even just to see my grandmother in Bethlehem, I had, to, I had to hire a special driver and go through several checkpoints just to be able to see her. It's, there's no freedom of movement, and it's sad, uh, you know, and when they celebrate Christmas there, there aren't that, I mean, the, the ones, the Christians that do end up coming, sadly, are the Christian Zionists, and they come protected with their little tour groups in which they really don't get to see the other side. Palestinian Christians, I think, have become a nuisance even to the Christian Zionists 
who want to have this self, this the fulfilling prophecy of bringing the Messiah back, and the only way to do that is to realize, you know, a Zionist Jerusalem in their minds, but they completely ignore the Palestinian Christians that are there. Well, I mean, there is absolutely there's a total ignorance in that aspect, in a way, a denial, mm -hmm. as if uh, Palestinian Christians are invisible. Yes, their completely. numbers have dwindled for uh, many years. It has been dwindling because of the occupation, because of the Nakba mm -hmm. and other factors. But also, even when they come for those little enclaves and communities, they are totally kind of invisible to them. Uh, and in a way, we Palestinians are very unique. In a sense, we don't like to talk about Palestinian Muslims and Christians, mm -hmm. maybe. This is something I try, personally, I try to avoid this because we don't look at it this way. We don't distinguish, well, this is a Palestinian Muslim, this is a Palestinian Christians, but they have pushed it in such a way that, you, you know, I think it's more important than ever that Palestinian Christians be visible because, to you know, just only to demystify this whole uh, propaganda in Israeli Hasbara that, you know, um, Palestinian Christians don't exist or they don't have any connection to the land. They are really treated like second or third class citizens. So in Jerusalem, for example, uh, I went to, the, it's called Yabus, it's a cultural center, and they also have a, a music conservatory. So this music conservatory is run by Christians, and they what they do is they teach children all of the different instruments, the Arabic classical instruments. And the problem is when they want to have a concert, for example, for children, they close, the, the Israeli military will decide on the day of the concert, oh, sorry, we're going to close your concert, you can't have it. And they're like, what do you mean? We, we had the catering, we, we told all the parents, everybody's excited to see the children perform, whether it's before Christmas or any other time of year. And of course, they always cite the same reason, security, security reasons. Well, how is a children's concert going to impede the security of Israel? It's not. It's just that they want to make them as miserable as possible so that they don't stay. And it's really unfortunate that they're even attacking children's concerts, for example, or theater or any, anything like that. They find threatening. They don't want any Palestinian identity left. They basically want to render us all invisible and non-existent. And that's why they always tell us that we don't exist. Well, I mean, also what's, what's uh, you've, uh, you've talked about it a little bit earlier, but it's really far more than complex uh, the um, the connection between the different uh, Christian communities within Palestine. And I'm talking about 1948 Palestine. Yes. And we'll talk about the Palestine from the river to the sea and this whole yeah, controversy. Yeah, we'll, we'll touch on that. I'd be happy uh, to. With uh, Mark <laughs> Lamont uh, Hill. Right. But, um, you know, people don't understand that Christians in Bethlehem, they live in a jail. Yes. So for them, I mean, when we talk about the centers for, of Christianity, the most important centers of Christianity, and then you have, of course, many holy places uh, within Palestine for Christians, uh, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Nazareth. So the Palestinians in Bethlehem cannot go and visit the Holy Sepulchre. Mm -hmm. They need a special milit Israeli military permission and, and a special military permission for anyone under the age of 40. Mm -hmm. So all the young people, they might wait six months before obtaining a permission just to go to, just make to, go it, to church, just to go to church mm -hmm. in Jerusalem or if they want to go to Nazareth. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, because that lies within what they call, you know, Israel borders and they cannot travel there. Right. Uh, so so they are really living in a jail, in a jail yeah. uh, in order for them to connect with another larger community, let's say Ramallah, which mm -hmm. is another Christian enclave within Palestine. The easiest way, the distance between Bethlehem and Ramallah in, uh, shouldn't take you more than about 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. But now they cannot go through Jerusalem. So they have to circumvent it with the, this crazy road, Wadi uh, Nar road. The road of fire. Or the road of fire <laughs> yeah. or the road of hell, which zigzags yeah. and circumvents, basically goes around the Israeli apartheid wall. And the trip takes over an hour and a half mm -hmm. to make it there. And it's almost impossible to make 
during snow or during uh, a rainy season. It's very, it's a very it's a dangerous, it's the, very dangerous, dangerous road that many people got killed on that road. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's not just like an occupation, but it's also a uh, an imprisonment. It's also econo an an economical uh, deprivation for the mm -hmm. Christian communities. Definitely. Uh, who many of them depend on uh, religious tourism. Yes. And so they've been shutting down store after store. Even within Jerusalem, the same thing, hotels, they've been also strangulating and, and, and starving these businesses. It's incredibly sad. I mean, one way uh, people talk about BDS, but there's also an alternative to BDS, which I push, and that is how to support the Palestinian economy, right? So when I was there and I, I visited an olive press and I, you know, there's nothing better in my opinion as far as olive oil than Palestinian olive oil because, you know, these trees, some of them are a thousand years old and they also have taken a hit in terms of the economy. But now you can, you know, order Canaan Fair Trade or Zaytun olive oil. Like just the other day, I, I, I ordered a six pack and it got delivered to my door and anyone in the United States can order this olive oil, for example. There are a lot of fair trade websites sites um, that support Palestinian art artisans. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a counterpoint to BDS, I also think it's equally important to support the Palestinian economy there so that they can survive, um, especially like right before the holiday season. If Christians want to support the Palestinian Christians there, they can buy, you know, the Palestinian olive wood. Uh, uh, they, they make like nativity scenes out of olive wood that they sell. They sell it online. Just look at Palestinian fair trade goods and you'll be able to buy. And so I think it's equally important to help support their economy in this fashion as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, talking about also supporting the economy and talking about also the holidays, we've started with the holidays. This is the Christmas season. This is uh, uh, Christmas season also all over the world. Right. In Palestine, uh, just the other day, we saw them lighting the Christmas tree in the Nati Nativity Square mm -hmm. in Palestine. And I want to talk a little bit about Christmas food and sure, and, sure. and uh, you know how people celebrate mm -hmm. and the it, it might be a little bit of a confusing thing for people but Palestinians kind of like celebrate Christmas it lasts for eternity because you have the Greek Orthodox you have the Catholics you have right. the Armenians <laughs> so they stretch it like for almost for a, a month a, almost a month, <laughs> a month. so right. uh, what are the great uh, holiday recipes? Well, I have them on my website. I have a lot of different holiday recipes. So traditionally, um, during this time of year, uh, they'll make, for example, uh, atayef, which is something that they make it during Ramadan too. But my mom will make atayef too, which is like an Arabic pancake uh, that's stuffed with either walnuts or cheese and drizzled with syrup. In about a week, or I uh, know, in, in, in about a week, I'm going to release my recipe for ba'lawa or ba baklava, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that we make from scratch with phyllo dough and pistachios and walnuts. Uh, we do make ma'mul too sometimes. Ma'mul is a semolina date cake that we make uh, Easter and Christmas. Um, that it, it requires an assembly line. You know, it's very tribal. You know, it's not just one person making cookies. It requires about six people together, you know, rolling the dough, stuffing it with dates, decorating it, baking it. It's like a, a beautiful uh, gathering of people. And then what we do is we like to exchange it with others. So it also, uh, it, it further expands the tribal mood of Palestinians where they exchange it with other family members. We make sahlab this time of year. So when my mom was a child uh, going to the Church of Nativity, uh, they always had sahlab stands. And sahlab is a, it's a drink that um, is made from like the orchid mm -hmm. and it's like really fragrant. Um, it's kind of like what you would call our mocha. There's no chocolate involved, but we top it with pistachios and coconut and cinnamon. Uh, and it's, it was just a festive way for when they went to mass to, uh, to drink the sahlab afterwards. And I have a recipe for that on my website. By the way, in case you're wondering my website, it's youtube.com slash blanche TV, B-L-A-N-C-H-E TV. Um, or you could go to feastinthemiddleeast.com where I have all the recipes as well, as well as um, the backstories behind the recipes. And, so. uh, and then uh, recently they, there was the, uh, what is it called, Barbera? Burbana. Barbara. Oh, absolutely. You're How can I forget about Burbana? Because this is, yeah, yeah, it has yeah, its yeah. own holiday. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, so it's around, uh, it's a, you know, first week of December. 
Borbara is a big deal for us. So we basically take shelled wheat, we make a porridge out of it, and then we have all these toppings uh, like, you know, cinnamon and pomegranate seeds, walnuts, coconut. Uh, after we have uh, like a mass in, in the month of December, we'll have the big bor Borbara porridge uh, with all the toppings and we sell it as fundraisers and everybody gets together and we have these heaping hot bowls of porridge. It's so good. I mean, it sounds weird. Like, why are you guys eating porridge? But apparently this is not just a thing among Palestinians, but also Eastern Europeans, like in the Orthodox, uh, the Christian Orthodox uh, traditions. They also, like I had a friend from Cyprus saying, you know what, we eat that too. I was like, this is so cool that they're eating but it, it has, in Cyprus, it, it has, you know? It, it also has a religious significance. Yes, the religious significance is, Borbara is like for Santa Barbara. So Santa right. Barbara believed in Jesus and she, her father uh, was very upset at this. I guess, I'm, I don't know if he was an atheist or what his deal was, but he actually wanted to kill his own daughter for believing in Jesus. So she fled, she ran away and she ran in a field. And, and as she ran behind her, would be this growth of wheat fields that would grow to protect her. So she was able to uh, run away from her father and get to safety, at least for the time being, because of these wheat fields that grew. So what we Palestinian Christians do also this time of year when I was a kid, my aunt would take these wheat berries and they grew very quickly, sort of like chia pets. You know how chia pets, they grow right. rather, yeah. really fast. So she grew grow these, uh, you know, these wheat berries and she we'd plant them and we'd watch and wonder how they like exponentially grew every day. And we'd take them and put them all around our Christmas tree, you know. And so uh, the wheat berries celebrated in that fashion as well as in the porridge to celebrate the Feast of Santa Barbara, her ardent faith in Jesus. And so it's definitely a huge tradition for us, almost as big as Christmas time. Well, it's also amazing also because uh, I just want to remind our listeners, uh, this is Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco. You're listening to us on 89.5 FM, but you can also watch us live on Jamal Dajani 2. That's on Facebook. And uh, this will be also posted on other platforms later on. Uh, you were born and raised in San Francisco. That's right. And, uh, and yeah, so you were a hundred percent San Franciscan. Yeah, there aren't too many native, of us left. Not too yeah. many, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And and but these traditions that your family, your grandparents brought back with them, still basically are handed from generation to generation. Yes, indeed. And and also, of course, the I like all the families. They say. The secret recipes. Yes. <laughs> All families have their own secret recipes. They do, they do. And so you and I know each other for a long time. And yeah. you, of course, um, started your career as a journalist. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden... Yeah. You're a foodie. Yeah, I know. It's and kind of funny. focusing on the you know, so how did this all come about? You know, the the love of journalism for me is still so massive that when when my book is said and done, I might go back to journalism. But I definitely took a break because I noticed uh just in common I mean, people talk about us like we don't exist. I mean, people have no problem on CNN or any other mainstream outlet saying there is no such thing as Palestinians or Palestine. And so what Feast in the Middle East was, uh, it rhymes with peace in the Middle East, right? Uh, <laughs> I did that on purpose. Uh, so what, what, that, what that sought to do was to sort of cement our identity through food. Because, you know, when you sit around a table with someone else, you can't fight with them. You know, I dare you to tell me that I don't exist over a, ta a, a bowl of burbada or whatever it is, you know, that we're, we're eating at the moment. And so Palestinians have such a rich culinary tradition. And I wanted to keep that alive so that it wouldn't get lost in today's takeout box. I know a lot of people don't have time to cook today, but for me it was incredibly important to show them like modern shortcuts to our food that would normally take four hours to make. Let me show you how to make it in half an hour so that you can get on with your day, but still keep that culture and tradition alive in the family. And you know what's spectacular, Jamal? So for example, I visited Hebron, Khalil, mm -hmm. right? And they made for us uh, wara anib yeah. and, and mahshi, kusa mahshi, which in English is stuffed grape leaves and uh, and uh, stuffed squash, right? Zucchini. So, zucchini. Yeah. This is a quintessential dish in Palestine. And when I ate it there, it tasted exactly the way my mom makes it. And here I am on the other side of the planet, you know, how many years later? 
And this woman, this, you know, this humble woman was like, do you like the food? Is it okay? I'm like, are you kidding? This is exactly the way my mom makes it on the other side of the globe. And so our food transcends uh, space. It transcends time. It transcends borders and it transcends occupation. And so that's why this food is so important to me. It's not like I'm sitting, you know, just baking cookies for the hell of it. Yeah. Th this food is, is a huge part of our, our identity and keeping it alive is very important. It's so popular right. that some people want to appropriate it. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so does this make you angry when you look at a recipe and say uh, in the New York Times and yeah. they refer to something? as Israeli couscous, which we know mm -hmm. the, it's from Northern Africa, or Israeli falafel and hummus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, in the beginning, I used to get really incensed, especially because they're saying that we're invisible, but at the same time, they're eating our food and they're calling it Israeli, which, you know, it, it predates 1948 by hundreds, if not thousands of years. Like, burbara is a 2,000-year-old recipe, right? That's right. Way before the creation of the state of Israel. On the other hand, I do have a lot of Israeli fans that have reached out to me and sent really kind letters to me saying, you know, we do appreciate your food and we understand that it is essentially Arabic, the words are Arabic, and, you know, I'd like to extend an invitation for you to visit us in when, when you're in Israel because we want to meet you and we appreciate, like, your culinary contribution, which is nice, and I appreciate that. I have also gotten hate mail at the same time from people saying, you don't exist, your food doesn't exist, you're a bunch of terrorists, and we don't want anything to do with you, and get off of YouTube. And then they'll try to flag my video and put it in limited state. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, wow, I didn't know that my food was so controversial. I didn't know that making something that my grandmother made is so off-putting to you that you feel the need to come at me violently like this. And that's disturbing as well. Well, it is, it is of course, insecurity. And uh, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, imitation is the best compliment, right? True. <laughs> but at least you have to say where you got this idea or recipe from. You right. know, we eat a lot of Italian food in the United States. My favorite food is probably Italian food mm -hmm. and pastas and pizzas, but we don't claim that it is. We don't is. say it's American we pizza. Don't say, yeah, we don't say that. We don't say that this is, this is Palestinian food and, and what have you. Mm -hmm. So at least if you are going to integrate a uh, cuisine within your culture, mm -hmm. you have to refer to it you know, according by to its uh, true by, ethnic. by its, its origin. Right. So uh, <clears throat> cooking Ara Arabic food, I mean, I love Arabic food. Mm -hmm. I love Palestinian food. I die for it. <laughs> I'm a good backseat driver. I'm a horrible cook. <laughs> That's okay. But it takes a lot of time. It does. Do you s simplify your recipes for oh, yes. now the 21st century for the working yeah. mom mm -hmm. and the working dad? And they... I, I remember my mom sitting with my aunt and whatever, spending a day or two working on a one meal, which we yeah. used to consume in like in 10 minutes. Totally. And, and, and it's still sort of like that when it comes to like stuffed grape leaves, for example. That's why I say, you know, make it a group activity and list your family members to help because then it'll you'll also uh, cement your relationship with your family that much more. But I, I implement other gadgets like I'll do I'll use a slow cooker. You know, so that people can assemble stuff like the main ingredients, put it in there and then not worry about it and not have to check on it hour upon hour. Um, I've taken elements like the ma'mul cookie, right? This this is like, a, I call it the four hour cookie. It takes four hours to make. Right. But I, I took all of the flavors and made it into a ma'mul cake, which is on my website. Anyone can make a cake. You can whip up a cake pretty easily. Um, and so you take the uh, appearance and flavor and you put it in a cake and all of a sudden it's more accessible to Americans. So what's a fast uh, recipe like for a meal? I mean, you're talking about desserts like uh, for yeah. people want to taste uh, of the Middle East and they don't have the time. Right. Yeah, so like for example, um, in this uh, baklava video that I'm going to be releasing in a couple of weeks, you know, you buy the store-bought filo dough, you buy the already shelled pistachios, you got a stick of butter, melt the butter in the microwave one minute, take the filo dough sheets, instead of painting each sheet, which takes forever, paint every three sheets. That way, not only does it take 
you don't sacrifice the flavor, it tastes amazing. You reduce the amounts of butter, you probably reduce probably a third cup of butter, which makes it healthier. And I literally can make baklava in like half an hour now. And wow. I'm gonna show the technique of how to do it. And it also saves time and it saves unnecessary saturated fat. So, I mean, there are ways to do it. And I just like break it down on my on my videos. And I show how you could do it in 10 minutes sometimes. Well, you're talking about the butter, but uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's uh, of course, for me, you have to yeah. have the original kind you of You have butter. to use butter, though. Yeah, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not doing uh, like an, elim but, I'm not eliminating the butter. But I'm just for using those a little who are health it. conscious, right. we know that uh, Middle Eastern cuisine is actually very healthy. Yes. So it also ad addresses other, because I know people now are um, uh, all kinds of uh, references, gluten-free, right. vegan, vegetarian. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of vegan, for example. Yeah, we have a ton recipes of vegans. We have and a ton. vegetarians. So that's why I'm, I'm actually, I have so many vegan and vegetarian recipes. I even have a vegetarian playlist and I even brought you something vegetarian today. We're going to uh, show this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, puff pastry enveloping a uh, filling of, whoops, don't worry, of, uh, let's see, pecans and chestnuts. So what is this? Onion. You brought yeah. me this here. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so that's a puff pastry. It's like a vegan puff pastry. In the middle are uh, mushrooms um, with thyme and a little bit of wine, olive oil. I use Palestinian olive oil in there. So that's that. That's what makes it Palestinian. Is I use Palestinian olive oil, <laughs> uh, plus the chestnuts. We we call it kestana in Arabic, uh, and so uh, chestnuts are big this time of year. Even in Bethlehem, when my mom drank her sahlab, she she'd eat it with uh, hot roasted chestnuts uh, yeah. on the streets of Bethlehem. They sell them a lot, right on the uh, hot tin kind of. Yeah, it's so nice. Them, yeah, it's in, in really awesome. Yeah. So uh, when you were there and you were. Mm -hmm. in Palestine twice yes and uh, how was your experience as far as food the kinafe the food was insane <laughs> and, and eat, eat, eating at yeah. people's homes and, oh, and what, what what have you I mean the, the did it food, meet your expe ex expectations yeah you know what's weird is that their food I mean they put a lot of olive oil in their food but somehow it's like I felt so energetic and so light no matter how much I ate and people are always worried, oh, I'm going to gain a bunch of weight. Actually, I even, I think I even lost weight. And I ate like a champ. Like, I was eating everything in sight. The stuffed grape leaves, the kebabs, like their chicken. Uh, because everything there is free range and organic uh, in, in Palestine, fortunately, the eggs have like this super orange yolk. You know, I think you know what I'm talking about, Jamal. Mm -hmm. And it, it just tastes like nothing here. And then there, I, I, I ate a farm to table meal there that like knocked my socks off. We were in Nusaj uh, Bia, that's in the, in the hills of Nablus, right. where literally they're taking the cheese, the, the, the cheese straight from the goats, the chick, the, the eggs straight from the chickens. They're making the taboon bread right there um, with the za'atar, that's like hand-picked za'atar spice. And they're doing things the way that they used to do it, you know, 50 years ago when my dad was a kid and they're still keeping that culture alive, which I love because I was worried that they were going to get into Pizza Hut, McDonald's right. and all that stuff. Even though you start seeing them like I see it's it kind it of like in Ramallah, the, the largest yeah. restaurant or one of the largest is, is Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's like three stories. I'm like, I what? Know. It's like, What's why that? would you do that when you could go to like a hole in the wall where they make the best chicken you've ever had, yes. the most tender and the best spiced chicken, like a hole in the wall in the corner of a chicken street. Tawuk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And also on um, sakhan and uh, things mm -hmm. on the taboon, you know. Yeah. But then you kind of, I guess it's everywhere where you have people adopting the they American cool. culture, having McDonald's and, and Kentucky Fried Chicken and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about my favorite uh, topic. Let's talk about it. Kinafe. I had and so much you talk, because you talk about <laughs> because you talked about Nablus. Yes. And this is uh, for our listeners. This is a Palestinian traditional dessert made uh, from uh, goat milk or sheep. Uh, sheep's milk cheese. Sheep's milk cheese. And the epicenter for this is the t town of Nablus. Yes. And you cannot compete with the quality of the kinafe or for some people, they pronounce it chinafe. If you, <laughs> yeah. are, if you are from <laughs> certain, certain yeah. villages, you refer to it as chinafe. Uh, I'm a Jerusalemite, so we call it uh, kinafe or kinafe nebelsi. Yes. 
Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so uh, the origin, like you said, is in Nablus. And I had it in Nablus for the very, very first time. And it was almost like a religious experience for me. <laughs> like I had to capture it on video. It's actually on my on my YouTube page. I did like a multi-part series about my trip to Palestine. And just a couple of weeks ago, I just put out like my experience with it. I mean, it, it's like it's made with love. They actually had the world record set for like the largest kanafa in Nablus because they wanted to cement it because, you know, again, cultural appropriation. Uh, other cultures are trying to appropriate it for themselves. But no, Nablus is truly the birthplace of kanafa and it's an acquired taste. I mean, it's very sweet. You've got this buttery phyllo dough over the cheese and they pour like a lot of sugar syrup over it. And it's still made that way with a dusting of pistachios. And uh, it, 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 might, it might be an acquired taste for some. They might try it and be like, whoa, Too this strong. is so strong and so yeah. sweet. But when you're accustomed to this flavor, there's really nothing. There's no dessert like it in the world. And it's it's like it's good for all celebrations, right? It really is. It's kind of you have uh, a feast, you have uh, Easter, Christmas, uh, mm -hmm. Eid al-Adha, uh, Eid al-Fitr. Any of these yeah. holidays, it's kind of it's not complete without having kinafi. No, and as a matter of fact, we put candles in it. And we do it instead of birthday cake in my house. Like oh, my my brother and sister, <laughs> they would take uh, kinafa over birthday cake any day. Yeah, Honestly. and and uh, yeah. and the thing about Nablus, of course, uh, you know they take credit for it. It's um, it's all in the in the cheese and it's, it's in the it's cheese. In I the mean, they've got the and, goats and there. the hills, what what they eat. So mm -hmm. so in, in a way, you cannot just like use cheese made of any milk. No, it has to come. It's almost like I compare it to wine like how the french take a lot of pride yeah. like this is bordeaux mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, from this region or right. that region Normandy or whatever. yeah and so nablus so is for Kinefa. nablus is like <laughs> like for them it's not, it's not just the art of making it but it's also the quality of the milk that's used in it right you know it's the, like the croissant of paris you know of france you know you can't it like you said it's it's from the earth uh, you know, you've got the rolling hills of olive trees with the sheep, uh, you know, like eating the grasses there and, and even eating the cheese all by itself. I mean, it was an incredible experience, like just how soft and flavorful it was and not gamey. And it's just a, a whole different experience. I mean, if you go to Nablus, you have to eat the canal. Yeah. So how was you, how did you find like, I mean, I always talk about like the, um, the spirit of uh, the Palestinians living under occupation, and, yeah. and 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 we, not just you, because I kind of now count myself amongst this group, having lived in the West for the vast majority of my life, mm -hmm. and we kind of like descend there and see them. They're kind of st they're steadfast on their land. They're going through all kinds of mm -hmm. crazy things, yes. you know, and then yet they're very generous. They're very welcoming. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you they're find incredibly, them? Like, they're incredibly hospitable. I mean, even when I went and visited the refugee camp in Jalazon, we couldn't sit down without them bringing the Arabic coffee and pastries for us. And I felt guilty. I'm like, you guys, you know, you're limited in funds and you're 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 running a refugee camp here, and yet yet they wanted to treat us with open and welcome arms. And it it is really <laughs> there's one one thing that one of the uh, people that I traveled with uh, that came with us from the United States and it was his very first trip and he said you know looking at what the Palestinians are going through it's amazing that they're humiliated regularly they're treated horribly and yet they never have anything bad to say about Israelis like despite all of their hardship they don't have anything bad to say about Israelis all they want is dignity they want to be able to live in dignity without being humiliated and to just have the freedom to live with their families, to go to work, to provide for their families. That's like their ultimate goal. That's all they really want at the end of the day. And uh, to see their kindness despite, uh, you know, their daily struggles and challenges, it really was inspiring to me. I, I mean, I felt guilty. I'm like, you know, we have these first world problems here. We have no idea what they're going on, what's going on over there. And at the end of the day, yes, that's all they want is dignity. And he said another telling thing that uh, this this gentleman said that really resonated with me is like, when you see what they're going through and how forgiving and hospitable they are, he goes, 
they're almost like the way Jesus led his life. It's like almost like these people were put on earth to show us how to live, you know, a, a, a decent, forgiving and caring life. And when he said that, that really sunk with me. I mean, it made me cry, actually, after he said that. And if, of course, you visited all the holy places. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't know if you're religious or not, so, mm -hmm. but how did it feel? I mean... Oh, I mean, I, I am definitely spiritual and going to... <laughs> it's, it's funny, like, I haven't been to the Church of Nativity in 20 years, right? My parents got married there. When I went up to the front, this happened not just once, but twice. When I went up, to, there, there's a massive line of tourists right. that are waiting, like a thousand people. And they greeted me at the door. They heard my, my Arabic and they knew that I was from there, just from listening to my Arabic. They said, where are you from? I said, I'm from here. My parents got married here in 1970. They said, listen, forget the line, come to the front. And they took me directly down to where, you know, the, the cave where Jesus was born. And I was able to go there with my family the first time. And I was able to go with the group of people the second time without having to wait in line. And I'm like, wow, this is this is home. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I feel so at home here, even though I haven't been here in two decades. They still treat me like I'm a local. And it was really touching. It was a very emotional time for me, actually. Uh, you're listening to the voice of Blan Shaheen. This is Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. We're talking to Blanche, Blanche for the entire hour. We're mm -hmm. talking about Palestine, her recent two trips to <laughs> Palestine in the past few months. And we are talking about Christmas in Palestine, food, and politics. Make sure you check out her YouTube page where you can watch her cook, and talk about her recipes and, mm -hmm. and basically making your life easier. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, you can go to also her Facebook page, you know, Feast, Blanche's Feast uh, in, the Middle in the Middle East. Yeah. You can find it there uh, very easily. And um, now we are basically getting close to Christmas. And uh, I think I've celebrated Christmas in Palestine in uh, 2000, maybe 15, the last time. Oh, nice. Or 16, yeah. So yeah. it's a big experience to go to to Bethlehem or even in, in, in Jerusalem. Uh, how do you celebrate Christmas here? How, well, first of all, my mom, I'm going to actually put this on my channel because it's really worthy of it. Um, you know, you can take the girl out of Bethlehem, but you can't take Bethlehem out of the girl. You know, I think that'll be my title. She makes the most massive nativity scene you could imagine. <laughs> she really gets get into it. She gets into it. It covers half the wall. It takes her six hours to put together. She puts more love and care into that than even the Christmas tree. And she's got the nativity scene from Bethlehem with the olive wood that's been carved by Palestinian artisans. And she just puts all of her love into that. So we go to midnight mass usually. We, uh, you know, exchange the gifts. We go to church. We, you know, between the nativity scene, we make all of the Palestinian foods that I that I mentioned. Um, it's really a time of togetherness for us. It's really less about how many gifts are we going to buy and exchange. And I really love that. And I and that's why I like even going to uh, masses said in Arabic here, which mm -hmm. there are some Christian. Uh, Arab Christian communities, Lebanese and Palestinian communities, where they will say the entire mass in Arabic, and kind of recreate the whole the whole uh, nativity scene just like they do in Bethlehem. So that's really special to me to kind of keep that going. Especially, actually, you know, they also you know, have masses in Aramaic. Yes, they do. Which yeah, which is uh, actually the might be the oldest uh, mass yes. or language used for for mass at least. It is for our. Uh, community, uh, the Syrian community in, mm -hmm. in uh, Palestine. Did your mother go with you on this trip? She did not. When no. was the last time that she go there? Has it My been? mom, actually, she ended up going there last year because she went to care for her mother. Her mother was sick and she wanted to spend some time with her and make sure she was okay. So yeah, she was there last year. She was there last year, but it had been a while. I mean, for her, it's like she... She would love to go more often. It's just, you know, the headache of just dealing with all of the checkpoints and mobility issues. You know, she'd like to just be able to go and be able to go wherever she wants. And especially alone, traveling alone, it's, it's harder for her um, because my dad has health issues, too. So it's hard for him to go as well. 
So uh, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, we 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 mentioned the Mark Lamont Hill yes. earlier, and we talked about cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, there is what I call. Uh, the Palestinian exception, or sometimes yes. we refer to it as PEP, PEP. you know, progressive except <laughs> on on Palestine. Right. And it's, it's something really unique because we've observed this year two I major events and attack on journalists, basically. Of course, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi mm -hmm. uh, by uh, the Saudi government, basically, and uh, Mohammed bin Salman, mm -hmm. uh, a.k.a. MBS, in, in the West, and this has made a lot of noise in the yes, news. Yes, it has. Because, which is justifiably so, uh, journalists banded together, uh, making sure that the story continues. Uh, and then, recently, we have this journalist and educator, Mark Lamont Hill, who's one of CNN's, or who used to be one of CNN's better and well-spoken journalists on the channel. Yes. And so he was uh, giving a talk at the United Nations, and he basically talked about equality yes. uh, for Palestinians mm -hmm. all over historic Pal Palestine. So we refer to historic Palestine from, this, from the river to the sea, meaning from the uh, Jordan River, river to the Mediterranean Sea. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, Big brouhaha. He's been accused of being an anti-Semite. It's crazy. Uh, CNN didn't even wait a few days to investigate what he said. They immediately jumped on it. Terminated his contract. Mm -hmm. We have people appearing on CNN who spew hatred all the time. All the time, <laughs> and they still appear on the channel. Mm -hmm. And so how do you feel as a journalist in, in this hypocrisy and double standard? I have a lot to say about it. First of all, Israel is here to stay. When they worry about Israel being wiped off the face of the map as the fifth nuclear power of the world, it's preposterous. Obviously, Israel isn't going anywhere. And why is it that peace for Palestinians and Israelis should be mutually ex exclusive? If you have peace and human rights for Palestinians and peace and human rights for Israelis. What is wrong with that? Does the state of Israel only contingent upon the oppression of Palestinians without any human rights? Is that the only way that the that the state of Israel can survive? I think not. I think the state of Israel can survive with equal rights for both peoples. Second, um, the whole thought of Mark Lamont Hill getting fired for this, I feel it, there's a sinister agenda here. Basically what CNN or the powers that be that control CNN are trying to say is that if you speak for the rights of Palestinians, you will lose your job. I feel like it is a sign to all journalists out there, if you decide to take this route, this will be your demise. You will lose your fat paycheck and you will be persona non grata. That's it. And I, and, and I think that's horrible. It's a horrible message because I think that we should be able to talk about the human rights violations that are happening. And, and from the river to the sea is not like a Hamas term, okay? They basically want a, a Palestinian state that isn't cut up like Swiss cheese by settlements. Right now, I mean, I saw it with my own eyes. I went to, the in, in the refugee camp, you had a UN school of children literally right across the street from a settlement, and in this, and to protect this settlement, the the uh, soldiers have thrown in one day eighty tear gas canisters at a children's school, and they've killed Palestinian children there. What they're trying to say is, we don't. If we want a Palestinian state, let's have one where you can have a contiguous line of a state without it being cut up by Swiss cheese by these illegal settlements so that they can live a peaceful life. But to them, it means, oh, that means river to the sea. That means the elimination of, of Israel, which is absolutely insane. Well, also, it's uh, talking from uh, both sides of your mouth, because on one hand, they keep, you know, the Israelis, they keep saying that, well, we've uh, accepted Oslo and we support a two-state solution, but then they don't allow a two-state solution by building all these settlements. settlements right. The number of settlers now is more than 800,000 mm -hmm. settlers live on what would have been 
the, the Palestinian land. state. Right. So you have 800 plus thousand settlers living on, uh, you know, in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. You have also Palestinians uh, who remained steadfast on their land in 1948. Now their number is close to a million and uh, and a half or a million, some people, a million, 600,000. Right. And then, of course, you have Gaza and you have uh, the remainder of uh, Palestine. Mm -hmm. So, so Jews are living amongst Palestinians, mm -hmm. and Palestinians are living amongst uh, Jewish Israelis. So right. it's a, it's a whole now. The egg got scrambled. Pretty much. It's pretty much. I mean, that's a perfect uh, I mean, uh, analogy. I mean, for when it, you yeah. when you traveled, there is no way on earth I would imagine that you went from point A and B by not seeing Israeli settlements or not seeing Palestinian villages on your way, right? No, 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 you cannot get from one Palestinian village to another without going through Israeli checkpoints or Israeli settlements, period. There's so, no way. So the reality on the ground now is you have a binational existence. Exactly. Whether the Israel likes to accept this fact or not. Mm -hmm. And the binational existence happens between the, the, the river to the sea. Right. I mean, you know, so if you if you go all the way from Jericho and you want to travel all the way to Tel Aviv, you're going to pass by Israeli settlements and you're going to pass by Palestinian villages. So this is this is what Mark Lamont Hill was talking about. Exactly. And now we what we are facing, we are facing the issue of equal rights because the current situation on the ground. I don't have to be a political scientist, <laughs> yeah. I don't have to be a journalist, and I don't have to be a genius not to realize that this is apartheid. Yes. And, and, and this is the status quo. And he spoke against the status quo, mm -hmm. and they immediately shut him down. Totally. I mean, this is, this is, this is exactly what, uh, you know, in the 80s, civil rights activists were talking about, uh, you know, uh, apartheid South Africa, mm -hmm. you know, creating It's kind of Bantu like a, well, you have Jewish-only roads there. So it'd be like in the civil rights movement, if could you imagine white-only roads or black-only schools or, you know, that's the way it is. That's the reality over there. It's like you have a Jewish-only road, even though they're all, like you said, scrambled like a scrambled egg, they still manage to create these divisions of, okay, you could take the good road, but you have to take the bad road. You could go to the good school, but you have to go to the bad school. All the Palestinian homes have water tanks on top because they, they only use, uh, allowed a quarter of the amount of water that the Israelis get. So Israelis don't need the water tanks on top of their homes. I mean, you could see it from the homes, the apartheid, how the apartheid works. works. Yeah, so, and every aspect of your life. So, right. uh, um, I mean, the story didn't uh, catch fire like it did with it's Jamal true. Khashoggi. Right. And this is kind of the deafening silence, again, you know, when the terminology PEP, progressive, except on Palestine, where mm -hmm. I see a lot of my colleagues who spoke against the murder of, and justifiably so, Khashoggi, but they remained silent mm -hmm. uh, when discussing Mark Lamont Hill. But then there are others, including, like, for example, organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace and, mm -hmm. uh, and other activists who now, because the big fear uh, for him and for people who support him is that uh, where he teaches Temple University might might also let him go because he's not a tenured professor. Wow. So so it's it's we've seen this more too often. We've seen it uh, right here in the Bay Area. The attacks on Dr. Rabab Abdel Hadi, mm -hmm. people trying to silence her. We've seen the attacks on Hatem Bazian at UC Berkeley, trying to get him fired and silence him. We've seen it. We've seen it with uh, Salaita. They've actually <laughs> rescinded their contract, mm -hmm. and uh, and this cannot continue. Well, this is part of an overarching campaign of censorship. So we've seen this before when they had the war on terror, and it worked. You know, they take an emotion like terror, which you can't really have a war on. It's an emotion, and now they have this new campaign of war on hate, and hate specifically has one definition, and that is the anti-Semitic kind of hate. But, you know, Palestinians are Semites, so by definition, you're not being anti-Semitic 
for supporting equal human rights. So right now we're seeing this new buzzword, this you know war on hate speech, and what they're going to do is create this overarching censorship over everyone's uh, First Amendment rights to carry this out. And we've seen this before, like I said, with the war on terror, and now this is the new emotion that they have a war on. When you have a war on emotion, there are no boundaries, there are no limits. So everything, it's all subjective. It's all defined by this unknown entity which usually ends up being the elites in charge and so what we're going to see is a lot more censorship unfortunately unless we put a stop to it i mean we really really have to uh fight this with everything that we've got because these these are our civil liberties at stake also we are now i mean just a footnote we are in the Trump era, mm -hmm. where we see a major attack on civil liberties, mm -hmm. and and uh, under his administration, they are basically shredding the constitu constitution page by page, mm -hmm. and so you have these groups who are trying to take advantage uh, of circumventing the constitution by silencing academics uh, and students on college campuses by uh, you know using the politics of fear against journalists like if you're going to speak on the uh, issue of Palestinian human rights you're going to lose your job right. this is the politics of fear yes. basically and this is one example they've made an example of Mark Lamont Hill mm -hmm. and Mark Lamont Hill imagine he's an African American also comes from a disenfranchised group mm -hmm. and this is the double punishment <laughs> he gets well, you know, you're, you're not going to see this uh, with, with Lemon, for example. I mean, it, it seems that at CNN, you can be African-American, but only if you follow the establishment. If you follow the establishment as an African-American, you will keep your job. If you go anti-establishment, you will not keep your job. So this whole, like, uh, if they actually care about Black Lives Matter, et cetera, I mean, they're being extremely hypocritical right now. It is. You've been listening to the voice of Blanche Shaheen. Uh, I urge you to check out her YouTube channel, uh, Feast in the Middle East, uh, Blanche's Feast in the Middle East, and check out her Facebook page, website. Uh, you'll find all your recipes. You don't have to worry about your holidays. <laughs> and we're going to have her here again. Again, thanks for listening to Arab Talk. Be sure to visit our website, Arab Talk radio.com where you can both hear and watch the show we live stream the show on facebook at jamal dajani 2 uh, thursdays at 2 p.m pacific and you can listen live at uh, on kpoo 89.5 fm san francisco to make sure you don't miss an, ep an episode subscribe to our podcast through apple or google's podcast app you can find links to our face our facebook live stream our podcast and more on ArabTalkRadio.com. Talk to you next week. Awesome. <laughs> oh, I like this music. You always have the nice.